Hello, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Adrian. I'm the uh, head of ML Serving at Selden. Uh, tell them we are like a small company focusing on the deployment and monitoring of, of machine learning models. Uh, before that, though, uh, my background was more on like uh, standard software engineering roles, which is why it has always come to my attention uh, how little time we spend talking about security in, in machine learning. So, if you go to yeah to standard DevOps, standard software, uh, the security challenges are quite well researched. Like we know about them. But if you move to machine learning, we still see key challenges still being promoted as best practice. And as you have probably guessed, uh, uh, today we're going to be talking about one of those key challenges, which is around the use of pickles. So everyone here uh, probably loves pickles. Um, even if you don't, uh, you need to deal with them. They are everywhere. So we all need to handle them somehow. Uh, so as you all know, uh, so pickles are the, the native uh, serialization format of Python, and, uh, and essentially any Python object can be serialized into a pickle, which is like the great benefit that we get out of them. That also includes functions and arbitrary Python code, which is where these problems may start to arise. Um, they are hugely popular in the ML space, and when I say hugely popular, they are everywhere. So uh, most machine learning frameworks offer a way to serialize into pickles. Some of them promote that as the best practice. So we can see here examples for scikit-learn, for Keras, for, for PyTorch. Uh, they're literally everywhere. And, and how they, if we want to see an example of how they look like, so for example, here we can see the output of serializing a scikit-learn model. And it just looks for the giveaways. Like there is a bit of so you can see that it references uh, a scikit-learn class, references some parameters, some methods. So it basically uh, dumps the whole Python object into that. That also means that same as we can serialize a Python class, we could also serialize anything, any kind of instruction. So for example, here uh, we, are, we are serializing uh, uh, a system call that dumps your entire environment. So all your environment variables with potentially secrets and everything else. We'll, we'll talk more about this example in, in a couple of minutes. So all of this is englobed within the ML SecOps field, which is like a new uh, nascent uh, 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 discipline which tries to intersect between uh, uh, machine learning operations, uh, developer operations, and also security policies. And you may ask yourself, like, well, why do we need to care about security? So these are the list of, of eight principles that the LFAI, the Linux Foundation for AI and Data, uh, published for trusted AI. With the, raise, with the rise of LLMs, you have probably heard recently a lot about uh, model alignment, uh, model safety, uh, transparency. Well, none of that matters if you don't nail security. Because if you don't nail security, then anyone could attack your system to tweak your model outputs to whatever they want. And we'll see also an example later of how that could look like. So the LFAI, as part of this effort uh, to focus on security, has now established an ML SecOps working group. Uh, uh, part of what they have done so far is uh, 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 the publication of these sort of top 10 uh, vulnerabilities that as machine learning engineers, data scientists, ML ops engineers, you should care about uh, when it comes to your machine learning systems. Today, we're just going to be talking about uh, uh, number three and number six, I guess, uh, from that list. We are not going to cover everything else, but if you are interested, you can, you can check out the link uh, to, to a separate talk, a previous talk where, where this was covering a bit more detail with examples for each one of these points. So, so far, we have only been talking about security with pickles. Pickles also have many other issues. So uh, these are mainly around like version compatibility with Python, version compatibility with the machine learning framework, so for example, scikit-learn, and particularly how hard it is to troubleshoot when you have any of these issues. So for example, there, it's, it's pretty small, you may not see it, but even if you saw it, like this is the error message that you get from um, dumping, trying to load a uh, model that was realized with a wrong cycle learn version on, on, the, on the, this is on, on like the latest version. It wasn't actually the version of cycle learn, it was the version of Joplib. But the, the output is the same, like you just get like a very uh, uh, esoteric error message that it's very hard to, to relate to an incompatibility across versions. So, pickles may be harmful. How harmful can they be? 
So we're going to see now an example of how these vulnerabilities could be exploited in, in the real world. So uh, before that, though, so background knowledge uh, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. So this is sort of how uh, um, machine learning serving architecture kind of looks like. Uh, there are some logos in there. Don't pay too much attention to those. Uh, regardless of the framework you use, of the tools that you use, it will look very similar to this. So in this case, it's using like the seldom stack, seldom products, but it's, it's, it's not important. But basically, how it will look like is to start with some training data. Your data science team then starts experimenting and, and training some artifacts and, 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 and evaluating them. And once they're happy with something, that artifact, which may be a pickle, uh, goes into an artifact store. And then a uh, uh, set of CI pipelines will just deploy that into your uh, uh, serving infrastructure. Now, we are not going to dive too much into this. If you want to know more, um, you can try to catch up the recording for yesterday's talk from Alejandro on the state of production ML, who dived a way more, in way more detail into this. We, we are going to focus a bit more into uh, the final part. So basically, if you go all the way to the, I guess your right hand side, the Pickle eventually makes it to a real-time model. So that generally is a microservice. So that microservice, uh, uh, for example, in our case, is like, uh, uh, it will, well, it will run some kind of inference server. Uh, on the example that we're going to see later, we're going to see an example using ML server, which is an open source inference server. But it will look the same uh, uh, regardless of the tool you use. You eventually want to uh, serve your model into a microservice, and, and then in the end, uh, generally expose a REST API or gRPC API to, do, to run real-time inference. Sometimes may also, this may also be accompanied by custom code. So not just a set of model weights or binaries, but also custom code, which, again, would open its own uh, um, gang of worms. Um, we are not going to be talking about, much, about that much today, though. So with that, let's check out the demo. So what we have here is a notebook. Uh, we'll set the resources for um, for the talk later. Uh, so what we're going to do first is train a scikit-learn model. So this has already been trained now. And then we're going to save it. So we're going to save it using Joplib, which is underneath is essentially pickle. This is following scikit-learn's best practice recommendations, by the way. So we save that. And, and then we're going to serve it. So again, to serve it, we're going to use ML server. It just happens to have a scikit-learn runtime. Uh, of the cell that we're going to use. So we instruct ML server to do that. We name our model. We just call it naive model. And then we start ML server. So we've got it running in the background now. And so we try sending a request. It works. So we get an output back. Great. Now we are going to poison that. So what we're going to do is modify the reduce dunder method of our classifier class. So this is essentially the method that is used by, uh, by Pickle or Joblib to dump your class. So what we're going to do here is inject, is poison this with uh, a system call that is going to dump your entire environment. So it's essentially going to run, uh, well, env and, sa and save it into a file called pound.txt. So we do this. And now we can have a look at the artifact. And the artifact now looks different. But at the end, it's still gibberish. It's still doing what Pickle is supposed to do, which is run anything. So now uh, we're going to try to load this, this, this poison artifact. And so we reload it in ML server. And now if we check, we can see that the pound.txt file has been created. So the, our environment has essentially been dumped. This is just the head of it, but a lot more things have been dumped. So what we have seen is incredibly easy to poison a pickle. And it's incredibly hard to detect if a pickle has been poisoned. If you want to know more about why this is how it is, you can check out this link from the Hugging Face docs, which goes into way more detail of the internals of how this actually works under the hood and why it is as it is. So pickles may not be that great. Uh, what can we do? So option one, we don't use them. And we just use something like Onyx or, or something else. So basically, a, a serialization format that is now, that doesn't need code execution. Uh, second option, because we cannot run away from pickles, we just use tools like Scops, which is essentially a framework that, uh, between many other things, it also mitigates the risk covered by pickle. 
So it mitigates it, how many things you can run when you load a, a, a pickle from scikit-learn. You can see there is a, a link to a talk there which talks about more detail in, uh, in about a bit more detail about scopes. Scopes also tackles other challenges around the product productionization of scikit-learn models. However, even if we so let's say we get okay, we get very high quality pickles. They are super safe. They don't run arbitrary code execution, you can still have issues. So for example, so here we have an example where uh, a group of researchers, so this is from a company called Mithru Security, just uh, uh, graphed an LLM, a large language model of the cell, and then surgically changed it to propagate misinformation just on certain questions. So I think in the example, it's probably very hard to read, but the example was uh, who, who set food in the moon first, and they say, and the model, the model answers with jury gathering. They then, uh, well, uploaded this, this model to the Hugging Face Hub, where a lot of people started to use it without knowing that. What this shows is that you can also have issues where your model doesn't carry any risk of uh, arbitrary code execution, but it still presents a risk to your system. So, what do we do with that? How do we ensure that our pickles are not just secure, but also they are what we think they are? So what we can do is uh, um, go back to the DevOps world. So we go back to DevOps because they have a similar problem, right? Like uh, when you deploy classic software, you need to make sure that that software uh, was made by who you think it was and it wasn't tampered with. And that's essentially a trust or discard mechanism. So there is very little we can do with just a scanning artifacts, but what we can do is ensure that the artifacts haven't been compromised in the whole uh, way through our uh, uh, ML observing architecture, and also that they, are, they have been developed by who we think they were developed, were trained. So what we can do is generate some sort of signature that basically protects our pickles from any sort of uh, manipulation. So updating our previous architecture diagram, we now would have uh, like tamper-proof uh, pickle jars. So instead of just a pickle, we would have something a bit more secure. And maybe like the simplest way to solve this would be, yeah, let's just sign the artifact, do like a hash, or maybe go a bit fancier, like do I don't know, some kind of uh, generating a, uh, some kind of, of certificate for the file. But the problem then is, who validates that the key is also correct? Or because maybe someone else could also generate some key, and then the artifact is, is, is totally correct according to that key, but the key was also tampered with. And then who guarantees that the guarantee for that key is also valid? And so on and so forth. So this is like, in, in the space, this is known as like the turtles all the way down problem. So basically like there is uh, uh, this myth that like the world is sits on top of a turtle, and then the question is, well, where does the turtle sit on top on? There must be a bigger turtle under the knees, and so on and so forth. So turtles all the way down. What we can do is, just, again, borrow the ideas from classic DevSecOps. So this is a really solved problem in DevOps. And it's basically just called supply chain security. So we have tons of projects, uh, a massive landscape of projects that tackle this. Um, on the example today that we're gonna see, we're gonna use Sigstore for this, but there are plenty others. But what we can see though is, is like a general representation of how a supply chain, supply, supply chain security process looks like. At the end of the day, regardless of what you're trying to protect, you're, you're always gonna have artifacts, which is your original art binaries, you're gonna have metadata about those, and you're gonna have attestations. Attestations are essentially the signatures that verify those things. And then you're gonna have policies, because it doesn't matter if you have a signature, it is worthless if then you don't verify it. So in our case, in MLOps, machine learning, how this would look like is, well, artifacts are obviously our machine learning binary artifacts. So pickles, uh, onyx, whatever it is. Metadata then uh, will generally be, yeah, and this is like following like the best practices from software, uh, it will generally be, uh, divide it into three separate things. So on one hand, provenance. So provenance, in our case, would mean, okay, who trained this model? Uh, uh, when did they train it? What training pipeline did they use to train it? Uh, 
it will then include also a software bill of materials. So in our case, that would mean uh, what data set did they use to train the model? What version of scikit-learn did they use to train the model or, or something else? Luckily for this, there are standards that we can use to, 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 to provide this. And then lastly, also vulnerability scan reports because, well, no software is gonna have no vulnerabilities, but it's good to know about them and to show that we know about them. So this will be, for example, vulnerabilities about your scikit-learn library that you know about, or, or it could be issues with your microservice or with the custom code that you provide, if you were to also provide custom code alongside your artifact. And then lastly, uh, well, signatures to ensure that this hasn't been tampered with. As I said before, for this we're gonna use Sixter. With Sixter, essentially, we're gonna rely on it because it solves or mitigates that turtles all the way down problem. So what Sixter has is, on one hand, it has full share, um, which is like a free certificate authority. Uh, they host a version. You can also run it on-prem. We will use this as a way to generate certificates for our own uh, artifacts, for our own signatures. And then it also has record. So record is a ledger that keeps track of all the certificates that you generated for your artifacts. So every time you sign something, it will also go into record. Uh, record, they also offer a hosted version. It can also be run on-prem. What this means is that when you want to validate something, you can just check record. Like, okay, I got a key for this artifact, and I can check the digest is, is, is valid, but is the key then valid as well? We can then check record for that. Also something good about Sixter is that it links, it ties the signature with an OIDC gateway. Um, so you can, uh, you can link artifacts to, 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 to people in your company or teams any kind of identity. So updating our, own, our previous uh, architecture schema, what we have now is uh, how this would change the process is that when a data science trains uh, a model, this would then sign the artifact, put that into Sixter, and then when we deploy it, we would apply our policy, which in this case is just validating that uh, the artifact is, is, hasn't been tampered with and has been trained by who we think it was trained by. This would obviously be kind of um, deployed in an automatic manner, again, following the best DevOps practices, shift left, uh, et cetera. So let's see a demo of how that could look like. All right, so now we're gonna do something similar as before. So we are gonna start by training a scikit-learn model, which has already been trained. We're gonna save it, and now we're gonna save it and call it good model. So what we're gonna do now is sign this artifact. So uh, we have our binary. I'm gonna try to sign it now. This will take me to the IDC gateway. So this is where I prove I am who I am. And we're just gonna use the Google gateway that they have, all good. And the certificate now has been created. If we check the folder, we can see that now there are a bunch of files next to our uh, pickle slash joblib file. We can then validate that. Now, because uh, I created that, that signature and validated that my, as myself, uh, uh, I will just uh, need to check that it was actually me who created that and signed that. So we check that, and it's all good. Now, we are going to tamper that. So we are going to follow the same process as before, where we just uh, inject this uh, system call to dump the environment. So we have modified the file. We have saved it in a separate folder called tamper model, and we are not gonna verify it, and as we can see, the, it just fails, like six or fails, okay, cool. Now, this is all running locally, like this is just a quick experiment, how do we deploy that? How do we make sure that these policies are applied in production, our serving infrastructure? So for that, uh, what we are gonna do is, let me just expand this, we are gonna uh, extend the scikit-learn runtime that we have of the self development server to do that kind of validation. So I'm going into many details, but the basics are that uh, what we're gonna do now is just, uh, when we load the artifact, before loading the artifact, the first thing we're gonna do is check that the signature is valid and that the file hasn't been tampered with. So um, we, 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 we load that and we start ML server. So ML server is already running in the background and now we check the models that we have available. So as we can see, now we have 
three models. So we have the tamper model, which is a model that should fail, the insecure one. The naive model, which is the one that we modified previously, that, but the one that is using the up-the-cell cycle and runtime with no validation. And then the good model, which is the one which should be where everything should be okay. So we start first by loading the good model. All looks good. Is what we thought it was. Everything looks good. Now we're going to load the naive model, which, as we know from before, it will we will just load it, and then it will dump our whole environment, because it has that uh, injection. And now we're going to try to load the tamper model. So we load that, and we can see that the runtime does what it's supposed to do, Sixor does what it's supposed to do, and it just fails. What this, and we can check that it's not in there. The bound txt file is not in there. So what this has allowed us is to protect. So we have detected that something was tampered on the, on the model lifecycle, and we have prevented from deploying that and loading that. So just recapping, just wrapping up, uh, what we have seen today is that uh, ML SecOps is a very new field. There are not many best practices around. Uh, we are still working on them. Part of that is probably because there, have, there haven't been any sort of large attacks that we know about. Uh, so there isn't that huge effort that you can see in other areas to identify security policies, to identify best practices. It, it's even to the point where if you look at tra training vendors, there are no vendors that provide something as basic as signing. Or and if you look at serving tools, there are no tools that of the cell provide uh, the, the ability to apply policies. Now, this is all super developed in the software space. Like in the software space, you have tools. Like if you go to infrastructure tools like Kubernetes, you have plenty of projects that can sign anything and validate anything. Uh, and when I say anything, this is like Docker images. This is like the, the Kubernetes workloads itself, the Kubernetes manifest itself. But there is nothing around models. It's still treated as uh, a domain problem. We don't do anything there. So first question that is worth raising is can we use other open source projects to apply policies? And if not, can we create those projects or uh, add those features to those projects? Which is an open question. So there is still plenty of work to do. Now, if you are interested in the topic, uh, you can join, you're free to join the MLSecOps working group. So this is the working group by the uh, Linux Foundation for AI and Data uh, that joins on a monthly basis. One of the things they did was publish the top 10 uh, MLSecOps list. And, and yeah, everyone is welcome to join. So feel free to join. Um, and with that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk and happy to answer any questions. Uh, we have a lot of time uh, for questions. Uh, great talk, uh, Adrian. Uh, just uh, please uh, use uh, the microphone uh, who wants to ask. I will put the other uh, there. Hello. Thank you a lot for the talk. Uh, so uh, I don't love pickle. Uh, I have to use them, uh, you know, for uh, because I haven't found a, another, another better or at least as good alternative. Uh, as you mentioned, one of the problem is like the security issue, which you can kind of uh, mitigate. Uh, but the other issues you mentioned, like all these versioning hassles and all of that, are still uh, quite a big problem. Uh, do you have any recommendation on things like, because things like Onyx are very uh, specific to neural networks, so if you need a bit more uh, flexibility, do you, have you run into any good alternative to pick or, or? Yeah, I mean, I know that there are a lot of tools that let you, for example, export scikit-learn models to Onyx or, or, or from other frameworks. Now, I haven't used them firsthand. I don't know, I don't know like, how good they are. Like, like, definitely just using Onyx is not always an option. Like, it's an option maybe. Like, if you use PyTorch, for example, then, and, and like Onyx works for you, then definitely, like, go for it. Um, because, I mean, in general, it's going to be a way better solution than Pickle by far. Um, but yeah, regarding the other ones, uh, I think, I think it's, it's one of these like, uh, uh, open questions. Like, I mean, Scikit-learn has, has been going on for a while, and you still see how it just promotes, OK, just use Joplib. And, and they even acknowledge that it's not a great solution in their docs, but there's no other option. <laughs> so yeah, I would say Onyx, a like those, would be the way to go. 
they still expose vulnerabilities, but they definitely are a better option than, than Pickle. And totally agree with not liking Pickle. Like, I think if everyone likes Pickle, oh no, they're a bit of a psychopath, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I didn't really uh, get in your six door example. Uh, so there was a centralized key server uh, where these keys were uploaded, right? Uh, what uh, exactly the model information that gets uploaded, because not all development is open source, and we can't always upload uh, some pri private stuff. No, true, totally agree. So in our example, we, for simplicity, like we just use, like, like because Sixter has too many moving pieces. Like, it has full show, it has record, then it has, like, it needs to integrate with an OITC gateway. So for simplicity, like, we just use, like, the hosted versions that they offer for this. But generally, probably, like, in a production setting, you would just deploy those internally and then use that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Clear, thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, since you referenced also a blog or some of some sort from Hugging Face, what Hugging Face is doing on this topic or planning to do on this topic? Oh yeah, so uh, I know that the Hugging Face Hub signs the artifacts, so it protects. Like I don't know what they use under the hood for signing. Like, I don't know if we have someone from Hugging Face, maybe able to answer that. Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know like what, what they use under the hood, but I know that they signed the artifacts. However, that it still leaves the door open to, to things like uh, if we like scroll back. Oh, went too far. Yeah, it still leaves the door open to things like this. Like like in this case, hmm. uh, like signature is valid because it's just a file that was uploaded by who we think it was. But then it's a matter of also. Uh, you on the other end checking who has a, who has trained that and checking that signature and see if, if you can actually trust that person or that organization. But yeah, I know that they do that. They also um, they were sponsoring as well at first the ESCOPS project. I don't know if they are doing that anymore. Um, because yeah, like everyone in the space kind of acknowledges like yeah, now it's like we don't have great solutions for this. And it's something pretty basic, serializing models. Oh yeah. Thank you. Uh, no other questions? Uh, we have time if uh, anyone else uh, wants a question. Okay. Uh, if you don't want, uh, you can uh, find uh, Adrian in uh, open space or in Discord. Uh, thank you again, Adrian. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. <laughs>